could you uh, start by telling us a little bit about the genesis of the project and, uh, and the, the themes and why you wanted to write it and develop the project? Um, well, both John and I have always been huge sci-fi fans and uh, really love the genre. And um, I think the sci-fi movies that we really liked and all of those that kind of try to say something about society as it is now, I think that's the great thing about the genre is that you can kind of talk about where we are today but without boring the audience, you can still do it in a way that's kind of thrilling and interesting. And so the key thing for us is to try and find a heart to the story. Um, and so rather than, as soon as we decided we wanted to make a science fiction movie, I stopped reading science fiction, I stopped watching science fiction, because it's obviously, I mean, it's, you know, it's, a film is heavily influenced, you know, I'm heavily influenced as a filmmaker, but the story, I really wanted that to try and find a, a kind of a, an interesting angle on it. So. Uh, I read every book I could on robotics and artificial intelligence and even a few on uh, quantum physics, which I kind of got through the first chapter before I fell asleep. And, uh, John managed to get a, an interview with me with a guy who works at the MOD who's actually building intelligent machines. And um, they've got as far as mapping a slug brain, which, so it's quite a way to go, but it's quite interesting that that principle of mapping a brain, the next thing they're going to do is a mouse brain, and then they're going to do a chimp brain, and then a human brain. And what this guy was saying is that the ways in which they're teaching commu computers to interact with the world is kind of similar to how um, some severely disabled kids have been taught to interact with the world. And so then I started meeting families with disabled kids, families with uh, daughters who've got Rett syndrome. And it, it just through kind of understanding the process of their lives and, and what these kids are dealing with, it, it just kind of made me think that there might be an interesting, that might be the heart of the movie. You know, who's trying to fix his daughter through this new, new emerging technology. And it's obviously very important for you as a, as a writer then, for a genre, to still ground things in reality. Yeah, definitely. Well, because I think, I mean, it is amazing how truth is stranger than fiction. You know, all the things that are in the movie, obviously they're extrapolated and they're uh, uh, taken to the furthest degree, but it's, they start with a kernel of truth, and I think that makes it much more interesting. Well, certainly for me as a writer, and I hope, I hope for the audience as well. I don't know if you <laughs> Later on. Well, second of all, those, those themes of, um, of sort of very paranoid Cold War themes as well. You'd made a feature before, The Why Lies, yes. that dealt in a very different way with similar kind of, of themes. And I, I guess as well that science fiction allows you to do that, to kind of guess it's set in the future, but it's about today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, John and I, we start the company with this, this uh, our first feature, The Little White Lies, which is about a uh, it's tiny, £90,000 movie um, set in Swansea about this family dealing with the, the, the after effects of a, 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 a racist, violent racist attack and how it tears the family apart. And um, really, after that, we made this film and it got into Moscow and it got into, you know, it got its nominations and all the rest of it, but basically no one's heard of it. And we kind of, that was heartbreaking for us because it was really hard to get distribution. And so we kind of regrouped after that and um, decided that the next film would kind of go back to our roots of what got us to be filmmakers in the first place, which is kind of this elevated genre of where, you know, genre movies with a heart that have got something to say. And so we wanted to kind of put all of that social commentary and those things that are dear to us that we care about, but also wrap it within, hopefully, an entertainment movie that people actually want to see. So, but, you know, yeah. And, and John, uh, as a producer, when, when the script's being developed and the ideas are coming along, do you have to kind of balance out what's going to be possible on a low budget? Lucky in that um, Cranmy were we were doing short films together. Uh, we were up against each other. I think no, we were in the same awards, the M Davis Awards, one time. And there was a guy called John Rennie, who was a VFX guy, and he made a short film as well. And we both, me and Cran, both looked at him and thought we'd really like to work with that guy at some point. I, I couldn't believe it's like 2004, probably. And he was no, doing like. Was it? Anyway, he had this like floating robot in this film, and it's like, wow, you can actually do that. So I did it in the bedroom, you know, it's way before Monsters and all that stuff. Um, anyway, now this guy employs like 20 people, he does Disney contracts, he's, you know, he turns into someone who's actually, a, you know, a bit of a kind of hub for VFX and Wells, and we've gone with him. We, we did some of our first film with him. So all the time that we know that this is a route we wanted to go down was VFX, and we know kind of that was achievable. The, the anchor that we always had at the center of the production was the location. We always knew that we'd need to film primarily in one location. We had an electronics factory which was probably about the size of one and a half, two football 
football pitches. You know, we were big um, and we got free run of the place. So that was kind of one of the things that enabled us to do it. So working within the constraints that we knew, we knew some of where we could push and kind of try and push me over the edge of the cliff as many times as possible and I'll try and pull my way back up. But is it, is it kind of daunting like when you're trying to pull money together to make something like that when people kind of think of British science fiction as very, you know, dour or potentially impossible to do on a low budget? You make something that's incredibly slick, very stylish, very stylized, very successful at carrying that story. But were there ever problems or worries from people? What should I start and then you <laughs> yeah, I mean, e e every day was a total battle. I mean, we made this little movie before, and so I kind of thought, well, I've kind of done a feature film, and it was you know, a very small scale, but I, I sort of know what I'm doing. But then every day was something that I'd never done before, VFX I'd never done before, and there were 400 VFX shots in the movie. I'd never set a guy on fire before, either <laughs> recreationally or in a film. <laughs> so that was like, it's all, every day was just a, a massive, Learning curves of oh my god, how on earth am I going to do this thing that I've written? Why didn't I write something simpler? And, but I think it's because we wanted to. It, it was good in a way that we didn't know what we were doing because we were so ambitious that you know. I mean, obviously we didn't reach what we wanted to, to get, but I think in the trying, we did way more than if we'd been conservative. And I think actually that was that was good for us really that we didn't. We didn't. Next time we're going to be much more nervous. <laughs> so, so I hope that doesn't limit us. But um, we can't yeah. Anything above that is kind of that's a bonus, right? So <laughs> you know, that's kind of that's that's just where we came from, really. Yeah. And, and then, how did you set about casting the film? You've got a fantastic um, cast there, um, and Dennis Lawson, I think, is, is absolutely brilliant. Mm. So sinister in virtually everything he does himself. <laughs> um, but how did you set about casting the film? Um, well, I mean, we we auditioned. Obviously, we were aiming very high with, with getting Toby, um, and he, luckily he liked the script, and he came in and read for us, and, and he just blew us away. And with all of them, they all just give the best audition, and um, Katie, we'd heard about the tax through our sales agent, and so uh, she sort of did a Skype audition for us that was, that was great, you know, and, and she was just the best one. She was, we saw lots of British actresses, but she was the best one, and I'd kind of forgotten when we, because we had like an eight-day rehearsal period, biggest problem for actors, I think, in terms of delivering good performances is not trusting the director, and I think you can see how that happens, because on a low-budget film, it's just manic. There's so much to do every single day that it's very hard to build any kind of a rapport with the actors, because it's like, stand there, do this, do that, do the other thing. And so both John and I knew this from our short films, and John was really good at making sure that he got me uh, eight days of, of kind of rehearsals with the actors, which isn't easy. What was it? Forty. Forty. <laughs> <laughs> which is really hard to do because they're very busy, um, but that helped us build a team and I think that helped the performances get better and because uh, we were able to talk through everything and rehearse and we got to build chemistry amongst each other yeah. and, um, and I'd forgotten by the time we got to the, the dancing scene, I'd forgotten that she could do back flips and all that stuff. Yeah, it, it, she did her own, all her own stunts, Katie. So. I was going to say, I mean, she's, she's playing two roles actually and, and one yeah. of them is really physically demanding. Yes, that's right. So she was already up yeah, she could, and, and you know, it's, it's quite a tricky thing, because obviously whenever you, you think about a robot, there's that horrible stiff, cliché thing, and so a lot of the rehearsals were about trying to make sure that it wasn't that, it was about finding, you know, I wanted the machine to be the most human character in the film, almost, the one that was most kind of uh, open to emotion and, and to, to, to be in emotion, really, and, you know, and so that, that, was, that was an interesting thing to find her child going. Yeah, no, the, the, um, the, um, the main DOP was uh, a guy called uh, Nick Galani Bruel, and um, we spent a long time hunting for, for a really great cinematographer. And, um, uh, but, you know, the way that the film looks is key to me, so I do kind of look books for everything. So I did a whole book for what the machine wanted it should be lit like, and what Thompson would be lit like, and what, um, you know, every character, basically. And uh, we talked a lot. And, um, and then of course he brings his own natural talent to it and, and the other cinematographers involved as well that were really brilliant about you know, kind of uh, getting
he was really great and giving and he's a really talented guy anyway, but also he, he was really close to mimicking the, the original look of the film. Uh, and that was a really interesting process as well, as having kind of two VOPs are quite striking in their own way they approach things, but working together really well. I mean, I, I, was, I was determined to shoot with anamorphic lenses because I knew the budget Again, that kind of polished look that we were after, and hiding the bits of the set that had to be kind of fully, fully built. I kind of knew that lens to lens was going to be an integral part of it. And I, and I love the anamorphic look. You know, I've gone back to films that, that kind of, I loved as a kid that got me into. So we sourced lenses with anamorphic lenses. That was a huge job for you to kind of get them nicely up in the end. The, the, the anamorphic lens that we because we shot with a digital camera, the Arri Alexa. But I wanted, to, I didn't, I hate the crisp digital look. So getting that soft glass in front of the sensor was, was really important. So, so it's great that John managed to put that to so, yeah. And what are anamorphic lenses? lenses are the ones that squeeze the picture. So uh, they're kind of concave like this. So the, if you just look at the raw image on the sensor, the, everyone's too tall, they all squeeze like this. Right. So what you have to do is then stretch it back out. And it just means that you've got very unusual lens lens. Normally in a normal round lens, you get a very different type of lens where it's only anamorphic lenses that get the flare all the way across the screen. Um, and then they're, they're just less of them around, basically. I'm going to go back. There's probably a lot of lens uh, fans <laughs> in the audience. One of the things I wanted to ask as well was um, about the music. It's a fantastic score. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your idea? I guess you were interested in what the score was going to be like in the record as well. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's all Tom score. Yeah, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not a musician at all. And, and actually, John, John found uh, uh, Tom, so I should can talk about how you found him. But, uh, yeah. uh, Tom was worked with us on a couple of short films. Um, and um, he was just a friend, actually, first of all. He was a friend in a mate's band. Um, and then he uh, convinced him to do a short film with me. And then we ended up working like three short films together. Um, and it was lovely to us to give him an opportunity to kind of grow with us, really. And, and we spent you know, a, a lot of kind of nights together playing computer games, discussing the films we loved, you know. Um, so I, I knew exactly what was inside his head. Um, and, that, and, you know, and that kind of, that was a big part of that. That working relationship was tight from the start. So it's nice growing with people. You know, if you can grow with a filmmaking team, it's, it's a nice thing to be able to do. And so we had a, um, when we were talking about the film and uh, sort of the, the, the sound that we wanted, Tom came up with this great idea of only using the instruments so he only used the, the instruments that Brian Gellis used for Blade Runner, and uh, John Carpenter used for The Thing, and Escape from New York, I think, was the other one. Mm. And so it, if it sounds similar, it's not that he's nicked any, it's just that he's using the same, in just those instruments, that was his power for the, making the, the score, which was great, because um, that's, that's the sound that resonates with me. And, and uh, I, you know, really, as a director, when you're working with a, a musician, you can only talk in emotion. More energy or more pace to it, and, and he's just so great in talking about that stuff and turning it into beautiful music. Mm. Should we say if you've got any questions from the audience? Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, you, well, you mentioned uh, Blade Runner as a thing and uh, Escape from New York, and I was wondering what kind of other movies, if there were any, kind of inspired you, or not, I don't want the word influence, but yeah, inspired you throughout the process, or that you were kind of, you know, hoping to put your own movie in of some other, and just the second question is, when you're doing a sci-fi movie like this, where do you set the bar on how sci-fi-esque it is? Like, you know, you could go in the future, like 200 years, and have, you know, flying cars, but no, your cars are just regular cars, and the suits that they're wearing are regular suits, but on the other hand, they have those giant iPad, transparent iPad. Like, how did you figure out where you wanted the technology to be for your movie? Um. Okay, so the second, the second part, I mean, in terms of how sci-fi it is, um, to a certain extent, that's kind of the budget that takes that, to a certain extent, it's obviously flying cars more or less, but every single one of those is, a, is an effect that you have to then realise convincingly. And so, it seemed to me that set, you know, in the near future, uh, in, one, in one way that was a budgetary reason, but also it's, it's an emotional reason as well, because I kind of think, 
it's, it's easier to relate to the characters if it's a world that's recognisable and, and a world that's, that's not too far in the future, if it's a world that's just around the corner, it seemed to me that that was uh, emotionally more kind of interesting than going too far in the future. So, so it, that for that reason, and um, in terms of my influences, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to say that I'm not influenced by the filmmakers, of course I'm influenced by loads of filmmakers, and this film obviously is a part of that, you know, the way that Scorsese and Thelma Schumacher edit is a huge influence, uh, composition of Kubrick, you know, there's, there's all these filmmakers that I'm sure, you know, I've subconsciously nicked loads of the shots. All I was trying to say before was that story-wise, I didn't want to rip off, I tried not to rip off stories of other films. I wanted to try and take a story out of real world research, that's all. But cinematically, I mean, there's loads of influences in this film. Yeah. Which is impossible not to. Yeah, I mean, as a filmmaker, and that's, that's what you do, I think, is, I think someone said, good filmmakers don't borrow, they steal. Yeah, I mean, it's just through research, I mean, it just seems, whenever I read a book about where we're going as the future, uh, you know, uh, futurists talking about where we're going as a society, whenever I read books about geopolitically how things will change in the next 20 years, because that's the focus of my research, is, you know, what's going to happen over the next 20 to 50 years, and the, you know, that, that was what they all talked about, so it just came to the research route. There was a subtext about overpopulation, It wasn't really so much that, it was more the idea that the new um, arms race is going to be about um, intelligence. It's going to be about, it's going to be less about bombs, and it's going to be more about the power of our computers, the power of our ability to crack another nation's codes, um, the power that we have to manufacture without human labor. And, and, and so it's, it's those things that, you know, the top minds in predicting where the next crisis will be, that's what they were talking about. So it was more about this idea, wouldn't it be interesting if America v uh, China was about who had the smartest robot? That seems like a really compelling arms race, if, if, if you like. So it's, it was kind of about that idea. Oh, no, No, it's not, and it's, it's um, I mean, you have to bear in mind that this was script, I started writing this script nearly two and a half years ago, yeah. and the amazing thing about technology is every six months, some unexpected thing is invented, but they were talking about quantum computers, and the guy, John, got me an interview with uh, the guy who works at the MOD, who's actually British, he said to me, be very careful to put in the word quantum computer into Google, because you'll get red flag, because government, red flag means uh, that your IP address will oh, be brought to the attention. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on where this guy is, is obviously, he starts to actually build a quantum computer, and there's a, a thing I noticed a couple of weeks ago on Horizon, he was talking about showing one, which is very interesting, it's the first time that they seem to be making those advances, but it, what was interesting with the MMD guy is saying, he, he was kind of hinted at, they had other versions of quantum computers that they'd actually put together, and he was talking about the computing in a test tube, as opposed to one with chips, Coils and you know all the rest of it. Yes, so that was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, not sound too sympathetic, but well, phenomenal science fiction. Thank you very much. Um, it, I'm afraid it was not known for its science fiction output, especially lately. And even on Play Seven, that's rather cutting edge. How did you go about securing funding for your film? Like it's, it's definitely.
So we, we make a promo, um, which was a, a, you know, a small budgeted promo, which just showed the robot and how she glowed from inside and all that stuff. That was part of the package, we also did a poster, we had the script. And then through doing some research on the internet, I found a number of angel investment networks shepherded towards different types of investments by a central hub. Um, and uh, we went up, you know, we ended up being successful and having the opportunity to go up in front of one of them. Went in front of a room of about 40, 50 people. Um, yeah, like Dragon's Den, I mean, you'd all be dragons and you'd all be millionaires. And me and John would be in the wings and there'd be, there'd be people, there'd be people out here um, pitching, you know, a, a new type of golf club and things like that. And actually they'll, Many audiences you went to, kind of older gentlemen out there, they're all kind of asleep and they'd only wake up when people would pitch golf stuff. <laughs> so that's quite disheartening. And then we'd come out and also we'd wait in the wings and there'd be people pitching like new types of medical stain. And me and John were like, oh, we should get some money to invest in that. That seems like <laughs> such a wonderful <laughs> idea, my God. And then John would have to go up and go, yeah, well, this guy's got an idea for a movie and I, I can really make it look really good. And you know, so it was, it was amazing actually that people would have the courage enough to. But it was through loads of these. You know, we, we kind of toured the country, didn't we? Going through, you know, this pitching process, and uh, bit by bit, the checks came in. The, the first one was like a disaster, uh, and we didn't we didn't have the I think the pitch was kind of okay. We had like the PowerPoint stuff, but we definitely got no money at the end of it. Was really disheartening, and they, and it cost the pitch. Like you have to spend money, you know. And we, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a good place to be. The second pitch went really well, uh, and we started to get we started to get a feel for it. Then. Ha, 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 ha.